Sometimes cats. I've spent most of the last 20 years up in the mountains of the Dominican Republic, um, learning how to swing a machete and uh, wrestle a truck over rocks and things like that, and also um, building hydroelectric systems and mini grids with rural villages and a lot of other things up in the mountains. So um, this is what happens when somebody who like me, who happens to love these communities and has grandchildren, sees the need to make a transition to regenerative agriculture as the only way that I can see of getting carbon dioxide out of the air. So, um, we're running out of time for dealing with uh, climate change. And there's a billion small farmers out there. and. Um, they're not getting started quite fast enough on getting that carbon back into the soil. So, um, at least some of us are doing everything we can to promote that. So, uh, if you could start the video. Estamos aquí en la comunidad de San Martín, en, trabajamos en el huerto orgánico para mejorar la calidad de salud. Ya no sé. Nosotras somos los que estamos iniciando el orgánico. Nosotras mujeres. Sí, el clima está muy cambiado. Está más, más caliente. Cuando está haciendo frío es de maldad, cuando hace calor es de maldad, como en Bombán. Sí. O sea que está muy cambiado. Más, más ciclones nos afectan también. Tiene que ver con mucho con eso, con el ambiente. Mm. Ok, what's missing here? What's missing is the link between organic agriculture. People are scared of chemicals. They've seen the results. Uh, I could show you some pretty bad footage, uh, which I won't. Uh, if anybody wants to see it later, I can show it later. Uh, but anyway, uh, they get the organic part, and they also are being pressed by the people who buy their, their uh, products to go organic, because everybody in the chain makes more money off organics these days. So, uh, but the other part, which you can't see really clearly here, uh, is the climate change part, and people feel the impacts, and uh, there's a lot of social awareness of climate change now in the Dominican Republic, all over the world. It, you know, people are talking about climate change. But the connection is the weak part. So how do you make the connection between the two? And the connection, of course, is carbon sequestration, which you do through regenerative agriculture. So how do you make that connection? It's not simple. Um, you can tell people, but I think that uh, after having worked with these people for the last 20 years, I'd rather show them. So uh, that's what we're doing. We are. Uh, we now have, as of last week, um, I just came back a couple days ago. We have the only carbon uh, soil carbon lab on the island functioning. Not finished, but functioning. Um, and if you could run the video, uh, oh, it's on the next one. That's the analyzer which we got off eBay um, thanks to a donation of uh, $4,500 from the Peace Development Fund. And um, it didn't work, it does now. Uh, could you run the video? This is what happens when you analyze. 
This is the process. It's hard to see it, that's taking soil samples. Take that soil sample, put it in a plastic bag. Anybody ever here ever prepared soil samples? Okay. Another eBay score at scale. And yes, we do wait for the results. Testing for total organic carbon in soil. I said this is the only lab that can do this on the whole island. And here's the context. It's in a rural village up in the mountains. This is a uh, paradigm shift. This is breaking the rules. Okay, so how do we make all this work? Uh, basically, uh, apply the methodology that I've been using um, with the hydro systems. Started the whole hydro thing about 20 years ago. There are now over 50 systems in operation. I've passed the thing off. There's over 20,000 people who make their own environmentally benign electricity. Um, so, what you basically do is you create a working model someplace, which we did 22 years ago there. Um, you socialize it, you, in other words, to let people know about it, and you support its replication. That's how it works. And that's how this is going to work for encouraging communities to make the transition to regenerative agriculture, which they're not making there at this point. Certainly not on any mass basis. Uh, you have to start with values. You can't just um, be value free in all this. And the basic values of this kind of project are participation, empowerment, democracy, transparency, responsibility, respect. It, that's what it comes down to, really. Or, you know, you could mention love, too, if you were at it. Uh, so, how does the model work? Well, first of all, this is the recipe. This is the recipe that's going to get replicated. You start off with defining where you're working. In this case, we're operating at a regional level. Um, select a focal community. It's really important to start off with a community that's committed and open and uh, is willing to work on it. Um, you've got to define a core group of multipliers, people within the community who will take the lead. 
then once you do that, you have to give them the skills they need. You have to, and, and in this case, um, there's a specific, which is establishing a viable demonstration garden. Um, and then you have to create a teaching center to spread it outward. And then you go out to the neighbors, the neighboring communities, and from there, uh, you go national. I think we're gonna go national on this um, within the next couple of years, uh, partly because the, uh, we got a lot of help in bringing the machine into the country, duty-free, uh, by the Minister of the Environment, um, took a personal interest in the project, because carbon sequestration is one of the few things that a poor country can really do to say to the rich countries, look at this, we're cleaning up your mess. So anyway, and it's not a capital heavy operation. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's what we're doing. That's the recipe. It's basically the recipe that worked with the hydro systems. Uh, where is this, uh, just for basic information, um, that little red area is the Dominican Republic. Um, the fact that it's close to Cuba is actually kind of significant, which is um, um, the community that we're working in actually was very um, influenced by the fact that in 1965, um, Lyndon Johnson couldn't invade Cuba. So he went and invaded the Dominican Republic instead. And um, that has a lot to do with why Los Martinez is a special place. Uh, it's in the mountains at around 3,000 feet. Uh, it's in the province of Ocoa. Ocoa is a city that um, has some history. Uh, back in the days of the dictatorship, when Trujillo drove through, he came in on one road, went out the other as fast as he could, because whenever he went through, somebody tried to kill him. Uh, unfortunately, around 1970, uh, the, uh, a lot of the creative people, the poets and artists, left and went to the city. So, Ocoa is not quite what it used to be, but it's still a pretty good place. Uh, this is a koa. This is a video. Uh, could you... Let's run this one. It kind of gets you an idea of the urban area that we're working in, the urban part of what we're working in. You know, it's actually kind of like a California Valley town about 50, 60 years ago. Agricultural service, um, uh, a lot of stores, little stores that sell uh, feed and, uh, and farming supplies. Uh, Los Martinez is one of the outlier communities. It's about a, a 30 minute drive away. And this is the road to Los Martinez. And actually, um, it's at the end of the rainbow, Los Martinez up there. Uh, it's not entirely an easy, an easy run. Um, video, please. Uh, could we get that video running on that? Sometimes people don't make it at all up there. Um, actually, nobody was hurt in this one, and uh, they put the truck back up with a, uh, uh, with a tractor and um, went on their way. Once you get up there, Los Martinez is this 
kind of spread out little village of about 65 families. Um, looks like a lot of little mountain villages in the Dominican Republic at first. A lot of avocado trees. That's actually significant. Um, typically, pretty typical housing stock. School with a bunch of kids. Um, not much in the way of other produce. They've gone over to avocados, which is pretty relevant here, too. Uh, then you start seeing some things like this, which are not typical of a little mountain town in the Dominican Republic. Um, there's a pro uh, project that of uh, fish tanks and worms. Uh, there's a, an ecotourism project that the community has been trying to promote. Uh, there's the path of uh, the avocados, which avocados, uh, as I said, are important. There's a, a very active women's movement in the village. This is their uh, this is their beekeeping operation, the women's beekeeping operation here. And we've also got um, internet in the village uh, with a lot of local access points, which is a community project um, where I'm kind of the technical advisor to it. Um, that's our pickup truck on the right that takes us up to where the, uh, gets the equipment up to where the um, repeater is up on the mountaintop. And that's, that's what you look down on, and that's Los Martinez off on the left there. The part that's on the left is Los Martinez down below. Uh, they've also got a packing shed for their avocados. It's a, this is community owned. This isn't a private business. That's down by the highway. And um, that's another video. Supposed to have somebody. Get somebody. Thank you. It was a community planning workshop last month. I'm going to cut it off there, but 
This is a very high level of sophistication for a rural village up in the mountains. This is not typical of any place that I know of. So um, this was one of the products of the planning workshop um, where they were talking about values. Um, they were talking about, um, well, egotism and personal selfishness versus uh, 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 versus being compañeros, working together, uh, consumerism, I can't even read this here. Um, uh, simple, simple simple, simple living, simple living, let me put my glasses on. Right. <laughs> I, I think we really good um, Violence versus love and compassion, uh, drugs versus um, home values, uh, robbery versus honesty, corruption versus transparency, uh, 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 selfishness against uh, consciousness, destruction against uh, environmental sustainability. You can guess which side of these, uh, of these values people come down on. Um, this is from another one, uh, another project. Um, respect, um, uh, they're very work-oriented, as opposed to being lazy. Uh, they're focused on human respect, uh, environmental respect, simple life versus consumerism, education, responsibility, participation, cooperation. These are kind of the same values that we talked about at the very beginning. So how did this all happen? This is, this is really interesting. Um, Los Martinez was founded around 1920 as a hunting camp for wild, wild boars, feral pigs. Um, around 1930, a permanent community developed based on very spread out, uh, short-scale agriculture, uh, short-term agriculture, uh, you know, planted and harvested kind of stuff, not much in the way of trees or anything like that. Um, and then there's a gap in the history from about 1930 to about 1965 um, in the oral history, which we've been collecting. Um, this was the period of the dictatorship, of Trujillo's dictatorship. What? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Let's back that up. This was the period of Trujillo's dictatorship. And we know that um, the community didn't like the dictatorship. That we know. But beyond that, uh, it's beyond living memory at this point. Uh, we are collecting from 1965 on, the memory. Um, and after the United States invaded um, Santo Domingo, there was a whole group of revolutionaries who moved up to Los Martinez. We don't know why, but it must have had something to do with what was going on before. And um, from 67 to around 75, um, the uh, local guerrilla bands um, were supported by the community. The community itself was nonviolent. And they engaged with, I guess, some support from the guerrillas um, in um, a very militant, um, uh, but completely nonviolent struggle for land that had been denied them that they'd been using for a long time. And they won. In the end, they won it. And um, it was a really resulted in a highly organized community. And, you know, here we are 50, 45 years later, and now they're ready to make this next step, right? Um, 1983, Green Revolution came along, road, uh, miles of plastic pipe, um, mostly paid for by Canadian Catholic money. Uh, uh, so it was the whole, the whole package of the Green Revolution. And they did very well with it for a while. Then, uh, it, and then uh, in 2001 to 2003, uh, we built the first hydroelectric system there in that community. Um, 2008, the community made a commitment to go to avocado production as a general community commitment, consensual commitment. So they moved over to producing avocado and really lost the knowledge to produce vegetables for the most part or any of that kind of thing. So, um, and in 2015, um, they played some politics, got the paved road up there, which made an enormous difference, and also that packing house for the avocados, which was originally going to be a warehouse 
um, for packing organic produce, but then with the avocado transition, it's been dedicated to avocados, but um, it's only used for avocados like two or three months a year. So yes, that could be the focus of a regional organic agriculture project. Um, women's group decided to take on the organic agriculture project. Um, that's a video, can we run a little of that? Women's group meets every two weeks. Uh, they're a pretty strong bunch. So, they decided to take it on. We needed, this is the other point that's really critical to developing this kind of project. You need a really good teacher mentor to work with them who knows organic agriculture. Luckily, this guy is Melin Mateo, um, is very idealistic. He's like 100% organic. Um, he's got four farms, um, comes from a village, the next village over, and uh, he went for it to be the, the teacher. This is one of his farms, not there, elsewhere, not too far away. Um, uh, this is a video. He's really into um, permaculture and um, integration. This is a uh, um, tilapia uh, that um, he's feeding all of his um, avocado waste to. So he's, uh, oh. this is the roof of his house in the city in Akoa. He lives in Akoa. This is our man. He's the guy for this region. Anything he touches turns green and grows. So he started a whole series of basic courses, basic workshops for the women in their gar to learn the basics. And here, this is gathering uh, the organisms, microorganism base, and he's teaching people how to do it, right? This is organic agriculture. He's teaching organic agriculture. He's not teaching regenerative agriculture exactly, but he's teaching organic agriculture. And then, of course, we need a garden for them to work in. So uh, we were able to get this piece of land, use of this piece of land, which had been farmed earlier with chemicals, of course, and uh, planned it out. And uh, it was the women's project, but the men joined in in the, in the starting of it. And uh, that's the garden. Uh, that's the compost center and um, they're doing microorganisms and compost so I'm saying it's not regenerative because it could be optimized for regeneration it could be I had a long argument with a permaculturist once about whether permaculture could be specialized for regeneration and uh, he insisted permaculture was regenerative, and I'm not convinced. I mean, it's regenerative, but it's not optimized. What, what is your objection? I, I think you have to think in terms of moving um, nutrients down into the soil and holding carbon uh, specifically. And I think, I'm not against permaculture. I think it's a wonderful framework. But I, I think that um, it, it's not necessarily as regenerative as it might be. Let me just let it go with that. I, I don't want to get into this argument. Because <laughs> I've had it. 
Anyway, uh, okay, so, so this is the garden, and uh, there's a the compost. <laughs> um, and uh, hey, it works. And then uh, there were a series of follow-up workshops, including with Ismailin, and uh, we had one which was boring and nobody understood with a uh, agroecologist from Venezuela. Um, well, nothing's perfect, right? Um, but the fact is important that, that the guy from Venezuela who was brought in by a UN organization, went to Los Martinez to do his workshop, right? And they brought people from around the, the, around the country, not the island, around the country to go to this workshop in Los Martinez. So Los Martinez is starting to become this teaching center where people come to talk about organic agriculture and agroecology. This is significant. There's this mailing um, on his farm, one of his farms, one of his five farms, four or five farms, uh, teaching the, the, uh, the women what he's doing on his farm, which is a commercially, a commercial production kind of farm. Um, okay, the next phase that we need to do is sustainable operation. We're only halfway here. This is a, where some of the stuff ends up, this is a box distribution in the capital two hours away. So the big thing that we need to work on now is markets. Uh, and three levels of market. One in the village, one in ACOA, and one national. Local, regional, and national. So that's really, really, really critical. And, it, you know, if we're talking about working with other communities who are going to make this transition, um, that's one of the things that they have to think about harder than we've thought about it so far, but we're working on it. Um, the other thing that's slowing stuff down is uh, you really need this constant supply of seedlings and the consumables. And that's the part, that's a part that's, the, it, it's the question of, you know, where the challenges are. This model that we're trying to create is a learning experience for everybody. We're not just, oh, we know how to do all these things, right? This is, this is the, this is the prototype for how you get a billion farmers to go regenerative. And, and it's not the only one, there's prototypes all over the place, but I'll tell you, um, I think this is one of the more interesting ones. Especially since we can show people that they're putting carbon back in the soil. Um, we should, can't show them yet, and I'll show you why in a, a little while, and I'll show you the first set of results that came off the first test runs. Um, teaching center. Haven't done that yet. This is the old village school. They've got a new one. Uh, the lab actually is right in the corner nearest us. Built into this building. Uh, temporarily, but it works. Okay, um, that's what, this is the space. Uh, right now, now the left hand third of that space is walled off and it's the laboratory. And the rest of the space looks just like that, right? You have to go through this to get to the lab. Here's the vision of the community for uh, what is going to be a national teaching center for organic and regenerative agriculture. Dormitory, classroom, that's the vision. All we have to do is find about $50,000. Regional le replication, need to reach out to nearby communities. Uh, we've got a plan for this. We're not there yet. Uh, reach out, it's a, the process, reaching out to the nearby communities, bring them there to Los Martinez for a session, um, and then going, helping them form their own garden group. And the idea is you start with small garden and then the commercial production, it's happening in Los Martinez that the big produ commercial producers are looking at the organic garden and saying, how do I do this? It's like inoculating the idea of 
inoculating a, a farming community with the idea of what uh, regenerative and organic agriculture is and providing them you know with the resources the technical resources to um, to replicate it so we do have a, a actually a, a a proposal for replication regional replication national replication we shall see but I think it's going to happen in another three four years I think this is going to become a very hot political issue in the Dominican Republic as in many developing countries because sequestration is something they can do and I don't like carbon credits either <laughs> so we're not talking that somebody probably will um, lessons learned people have well, women have this ag still have this ag agro-industrial mindset where you plant everything uh, the same this, plant the whole field to one thing, you harvest it and sell it. And that's, um, um, that's not what they need to start with. But they really need to start with local, with local use because they're buying their vegetables. People come up that road on motorbikes and sell them vegetables, right? So that's the first thing is they need to move past this agro-industrial mindset of monocultures. Um, and it's really hard for them to do continuous diverse production and part of the reason is that they haven't been able to get the seeds and I didn't realize we could just uh, buy them on online and have them sent in. Turns out you can bring in sealed packets of seeds, you can't bring in loose seeds without a lot of, a lot of mess with the government. Um, so the other thing is the nursery for the seedlings has not been done well. So that's another of the places where we really need to work and we will um, uh, this fall we will i'm going back in four weeks and that's one of the things we're going to be working on um, and ismailian's got it that that's a problem too he's got a wonderful seed operation a, a big wonderful i've got a picture of it in here um which you haven't seen yet um, the other is to develop more mentoring availability you really need I, I've been driving this mailing up once a week, and if I'm not there to drive him up, he usually won't go. So what we really need to do is, um, that's another thing, is like the diversity of mentoring has to be developed. That's one of the lessons. Um, and you need a bunch of money, because we started this with zero, and there's been about $600 invested in the garden, and it's not enough. Uh, like they. They need a shed to keep their tools in, they need more seed, they need, um, and they need a chipper. They really need a chipper up there so they can make their compost, because uh, they've got a lot of good um, material to chip. Um, and uh, need to focus more on markets. This is our, these are our lessons learned and where we need to improve. Uh, next step is, uh, we need, as, as I said, fundraising. Yeah, same thing. Okay. Um, this is their first runs off the analyzer. Um, total soil carbon in the soil uh, of the garden is only like half a percent. That's it. Half a percent. It's all like sand and little bits of soil in between the sand grains. You can grow stuff in it, but hey, this isn't this isn't a productive environment. Um, outside the seed bed, it's, it's the same thing outside the beds too, because uh, it, 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 the organic carbon in the year they've been doing this um, hasn't come up. And this is what happened with the West Marin people too. They thought they were gonna be um, raising their carbon content right up through the roof right away and they started then then they started testing and discovered that all that they were doing was maintaining their carbon content they weren't um, um, they weren't increasing it and they were very surprised disappointed and then changed their techniques and now zoom they're adding carbon to their soils based on being able to measure it's science it's participatory science this is Participatory science doesn't often happen up in a mountain village in the Dominican Republic, but it is here. And uh, their compost, though, that batch of compost they took out, that was 
11% total organic carbon. So, here you go. Right now they're running half a percent in those beds. How much carbon are they going to put in those beds to, even if they get, after 10 years or 5 years, if they're up at even half of the total organic carbon that's coming out of the compost pile? They're going to be taking carbon out of the air and putting it in soil. And we're going to show it to the world. Um, yeah. What's total organic carbon and total organic, organic carbon total? Oh, um, that's total organic carbon in the, in the samples we measured. The, the measured samples were sieved and almost all the organic matter went into the, went past the sieve and almost all of the sand stayed in the sieve. So that way we get total organic carbon for the, uh, for the sieved rich organic matter, fairly rich, and then uh, um, total organic carbon for the whole thing. Okay, we're just about done here. Um, I would like to invite people uh, to come to Los Martinez, and I would also like to, if anybody's interested in, um, uh, we're looking for an intern, among other things, somebody who knows something about organic agriculture, but not necessarily a total expert, to come up there for a couple of months. Um, they'd have to pay their plane fare, which is around $600, but everything else will be taken care of. Um, we're also uh, looking for any opportunity for outreach, publicity, um, I've got a bunch of these flyers uh, in my pack here. I'd be happy to hand them to people. And um, uh, any donations uh, uh, through the website are tax deductible. Um, you know, it's the usual. Uh, and I'll be in the Bay Area another four weeks, and if anybody wants me to come to a house party or whatever, um, or knows of a Spread the word, you know, or a journalist who'd like to write about this, because this is really significant stuff, and it's under the radar still.